All right, thank you everyone. The picture that you see on the screen is a composite image. One half, the top half above the line, is a high dynamic, high dynamic range photograph. And below the line is a simulated rendering. And the point that I want to make with this image is that as architects, we want the ability to see what a space is going to look like before we build it and to have an accurate idea of the lighting and light patterns in that space. We haven't always had that ability. Uh, for a long time, we designed on paper. And doing that, we had to imagine what a space was going to look like. We'd use intuition and knowledge from past work. Today, the designs that we make are digital from start to finish. These students are working on a project where they make a design and then test it using building simulation tools and then work on the design from that iter iteratively. And as you look at the design process, our models go from you know, very simple to very complex until we get to the real building. And traditionally, when we've been able to run simulations, the role of simulation has fallen here toward the end of the design process. Unfortunately, at that point, we have very little ability to make changes to the design if we find out that something is wrong with it, and the cost of those changes is very high. Other work that's been done by our lab here at MIT, for instance, the Diva for Rhino program, has helped to automate workflows and bring the role of simulation earlier into the design process. And what I'd like to show today is that we can bring that role earlier still and get back simulation feedback while we're developing the ideas. I'm going to focus in my examples today on daylight and simulation. And there are two kinds of simulation that that encompasses. One is illumination simulation. That's answering the question, do we have enough light entering the space through daylight so that we can perform tasks in the space? And the other is visual comfort simulation. And that's the question, do we have too much light or too much contrast such that it could cause pain to the human visual system? And throughout this presentation, I'll be using images like this, which are a fisheye projection shown in false color, where purple represents very dim parts of the scene and yellow represents very bright parts. So get used to seeing this. One of the drawbacks that I want to mention about simulation is that we often face a trade-off between speed and accuracy. So here are two images, one of which I would characterize as coming from an accurate simulation, which ran in about 49 minutes. And the other came from a fast simulation that ran in uh, under two minutes. And as you'll see from all of the purple in that faster image, it's predicted a very dim scene. And if we were to use that information in the design process, we might conclude that the windows were too small in this room, and we need to make them bigger and could expose ourselves to the possibility of solar overheating or glare. But if we look at an architect's design process, and here I'm looking at one architect working for a period of three hours that's time shown on the horizontal axis, and working in Rhino with the number of objects manipulated by each Rhino command shown on the vertical axis. And in that time frame, there's only one time when the architect could have run a 49-minute simulation, and that's when the architect took lunch. But as our simulations get shorter, there are more and more times when we can fit them into our process. So how fast do we really need our simulations to be? Well. The field of human-computer interaction has studied how we react to feedback that comes at different lengths of time, different timescales. And there are different thought processes that are involved in each one. So on the short end of the spectrum, we have deliberate acts. So those are muscle movements involved in moving a mouse or a trackpad or a keyboard. And on the longer end, we have unit tasks. These are things that involve thinking and strategy, like making a move in a game or making a model or writing a sentence. And somewhere in the middle, we have cognitive operations, individual decisions and queries that we make. And that's the realm where we need to get our simulations to work in. That's the realm where we start to notice whether or not the behavior of a tool we use is interactive, and we start to react to delays if information doesn't come back fast enough. And we set our target at around half of a second for feedback. So, one way we could get feedback that quickly would be to accept less accuracy. How accurate do our simulations need to be? There have been a number of studies of illuminant simulations that look at their accuracy of very accurate simulation methods compared to physical measurements, and the error that we tend to get is a result of modeling inaccuracy. 
And in those trials, we found that we tend to be able to get simulation accuracies of about 20% within measured values. And in fact, the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America has independently set a target that we should expect our simulations to be within 20% of actual values. So from this information, I've made two goals for myself. One is that I want to be able to create interactive simulations that return results within half of a second. And the other is I want those simulations to be accurate to within 20% of measured values. How do we achieve both of those goals simultaneously? One possibility is we could just wait. Moore's law says that the density of transistors on a computer chip doubles approximately every two years. And so for a long time it was the case that if I wanted my simulation to run faster, I would go out and buy a newer machine. And on that newer machine, things would run faster because clock speed increased with the density of transistors. And that was true until about 2004. And in 2004, things changed. We reached a point where because of economic and heat loss problems, it wasn't feasible to make our chips faster, but we kept putting more transistors on them, and we used those transistors to put more cores onto the chips. So now, instead of running one operation at a time, we could run two or four or 16 by running each operation simultaneously on a separate core on the CPU. And I'm going to focus in my talk on graphics processing units, or GPUs, because those co contain not four or eight or 16 cores, but typically thousands of cores. And they contain those so that they're able to process the calculations for each pixel of the image that they create simultaneously. And so I want to show in this thesis presentation is this, that using GPU parallelism, we can run accurate daylighting simulations at interactive speeds. And furthermore, that doing this will allow architects to make better decisions. I'm not the first person to use GPUs for building performance simulations. In fact, going about, back about a decade now, we've seen it being done in areas like fluid dynamics to analyze air movement in rooms. And here are some publications in that area. Or in room acoustics, also for about a decade. And more recently, we've started to do it in radiant heat transfer problems and in daylighting. And just to establish my expertise in this area, I want to point out that these are the papers that I wrote, and these are the ones that have cited my work. So in this presentation, I'm going to start by introducing Accelerad, which is a tool that I created to run parallel daylighting simulations on GPUs. Then I'll introduce irradiance caching, which is a method that's been used in the past to speed up daylighting calculations and show how that can also be parallelized. And using that, I'll show three studies. The first was a validation study, which was the first study to show that we can create accurate visual comfort simulations, and we can run them on GPUs as well as CPUs. The second was a comparison of several different methods for annual simulations to see how well they parallelized to GPUs. And the third is a user study to analyze how architects and designers react to receiving visual comfort simulation information in real time. So let me start by introducing Accelerad. Accelerad is based on Radiance, which is an open source industry standard tool for daylighting simulations. Radiance includes a number of individual programs, including RPICT for rendering, RTRACE for daylight sensor simulation, RCONTRIB and RTRACE DC, which are two different programs that can do annual simulations, and RVIEW, which is a graphic user interface for debugging simulations. All of these tools work using ray tracing. The idea of ray tracing is that given a scene like this surface containing the sphere, we can send out a number of rays from our sensor through an image plane. And each of those rays, when it hits a surface, will test, first of all, by sending another ray to see if light directly hits that surface. And secondly, to test a distribution to see if there is diffuse lighting falling on that surface. And based on that information, it can calculate a color for that hit point and project that back on the image plane. In Radiance, all of this work is done in serial on the CPU, meaning that we send out one ray at a time and we do the diffuse calculation for that ray before we go on and proceed to the next ray. What I did in Accelerad was to parallelize that on the GPU using NVIDIA's optics ray tracing engine. 
That means that all of those primary arrays are sent out simultaneously, each on its own thread on the GPU, and the diffuse calculations are also done in parallel, each on the thread for its primary array. And here are some of the preliminary results from that study. The Radiant simulation took 92 seconds to run, and the Accelerad simulation took 12 seconds. I hope that you'll agree that these images look very similar. In fact, the difference in mean luminance between these two simulation results is less than 1%. I was also curious, how much speed up could we get out of this? So using R-Trace, I tested by running various numbers of rays shown on the horizontal axis to find out how much time they took to run, which is shown on the vertical axis. And while radiance varies linearly, we can see that after we get to about a million rays in Accelerad, we get a nice speed up of about 20 times. So what I've shown here is that using distribution ray tracing, we can achieve accuracy within 1% using Accelerad, and we can achieve a speed up of about 20 times. But there are other ways to get speed ups out of ray tracing. And one of those is irradiance caching. And in order to make it practical to run on the GPU, we need to be able to implement irradiance caching on the GPU as well. The idea of irradiance caching is that when we send out those rays and create our diffuse calculations, we can apply those calculations to a region around the original hit point. And we only have to perform a new diffuse calculation if we hit some point that wasn't already encompassed by a previous calculation. And one of the things that I want to point out about this method is that it's order dependent. So if I were to shoot out those original rays in the opposite order, I would end up performing the calculations at a different set of points. Now that creates a problem when I implement it on the GPU. And I'm showing this warning symbol in the corner of the slide to show that there's a problem occurring. And that problem is that because I'm dependent on the prior information that I have for each ray, when I send out all of those rays in parallel, I have no prior information, and I have nothing to tell me which of those hit points I need to perform diffuse calculations for. Now in computer graphics, there have been other uh, groups of researchers who have faced this problem, and they've created various solutions that work either in screen space so that are view dependent, or work in world space that can be applied to multiple different views once they're calculated. And for those ones that work in world space, they tend to be based on some idea like this. I'll first create a geometry sampling pass where I will send out a bunch of rays and bounce around the space to identify what points in the space might be relevant to my problem. And having found those points, I can do diffuse sampling at those points. And I can diagram that to look something like this. In addition to the direct lighting that I need to calculate, I'll do a geometric sampling pass. I'll use that information at my first bounce level to do diffuse sampling, and I'll populate an irradiance cache with those results that I'll then use to create the final image. And in fact, I don't need to do my diffuse sampling at all of the points that I initially identify. I could do clustering, for instance, k-means clustering, and I could choose a subset of those points that are really important. But there's a problem with this method, and that is that as I increase the number of bounces in typical rendering, the brightness of the scene will increase because I'm including more paths that light could come in through multiple bounces to reach my camera. The first bounce solution looks plausible, and it's certainly good enough for a lot of animation requirements. But for accurate lighting, that only gives me about a third of the total illumination in the scene. So I really need to run at least five bounces before my scene starts to level off in brightness. What I decided that I could do was that when I did that diffuse sampling from one of those points, I was likely to hit other points in the scene that are already relevant to my calculation. So I could previously have done diffuse sampling at those points. Essentially, that means that I'm taking the points that I've identified from k-means clustering, doing a second geometry sampling pass, and using that to create a second irradiance cache. And in fact, I can do this recursively for a third bounce, and so on and so on to the nth bounce. And as an algorithm, that works something like this. I'll work my way down the left-hand column, calculating points that I need to worry about, and then back up the right-hand column, calculating irradiance caches until I make my final image. Here are some results from doing that. The radiance image took over three hours to simulate, and, by, and that was using irradiance caching. And by using irradiance caching in Accelerad, I've taken that down to 10 minutes. And in fact, as I increase the number of bounces that I'm worried about in my scene, 
the speed up that I get, shown in orange in this chart, increases, and the error in my simulation result decreases until I get something below my target value of 20%. Unfortunately, there's still a problem here, and that is that using an algorithm like k-means clustering, I'm likely to not fully cover my scene. So in this image, I've taken the points in my scene that weren't covered by some value in the irradiance cache and colored them in black. The good news is that 96% of this image is correctly colored. But you'll probably agree that that 4% that's not is enough to make you not want to use this image as a simulation result. I could fix that by changing the size of the irradiance cache and including more points. And that's going to have an effect on how much time my simulation takes to run. If my simulation has very few points in it, then I'll have a, a longer simulation because I'll spend more time trying to fill in the missing parts afterwards, and I'll also get a rather dim result. If I have a very large irradiance cache, I'll get a bright result, but it will take a long time to calculate all of the points that I'm interested in. So I want to choose somewhere in the middle well, where I've covered enough of the scene, but I'm not taking too long to, cal to, uh, to calculate all the points that I might want to calculate. So I wanted to come up with an algorithm that would allow me to choose the number of points automatically instead of me having to guess what it would be. I developed the cell-based clustering method to replace k-means in my, in my algorithm. The way that works, and I'll show it here in two dimensions, is that I take my cell and choose a set of points over it and calculate diffuse values at those points. And it's likely that some parts of that cell will not be covered by the points that I originally chose. So I can go back in with the fine sampling pass choose points more closely spaced, and calculate diffuse values at those. And now I've covered my entire scene, but not with the number of points that I would have needed to cover it in if I'd done a fine sampling at the beginning. And in my algorithm, that looks like this. I'll call what I'd already done my coarse sampling. I'll undo some of it and replace it with a fine sampling pass at the last bounce. And then I'll go back through and continue to do that until I get to the original image. And here are some results from that. I'm comparing now my k-means clustering approach, which took 27 seconds and covered 96% of the scene, to my cell-based clustering approach, which takes one second longer and covers nearly all of the scene. There are still seven pixels that didn't get covered, and they're all on the underside of that mullion and the window. But I think that you'll agree that that image is good enough that I can use it for my simulation results. So what I've shown here is that using a radiance caching, I can get a speed up now of 24 times, even faster than what I'd done previously, and my accuracy is still acceptable within my 20% limit. But up to this point, I've been comparing accuracy to other simulations, and what I really want to do is compare it to measured values. So this is where I'll introduce my validation study. I performed the study in the Smarts Lounge, which is just down the hall from us. And for that, I modeled these four buildings that are part of MIT's campus. I also used information from a weather station that we've located on the roof of Building 1. The Smarts Lounge is a pretty small space, which makes it convenient for modeling. It contains one window that looks into the courtyard, one door, and one conference table, which we outfitted as a desk and put a monitor on it. We also went in and measured the reflectance of surfaces in the space, and so that, then I used that information to color my SketchUp model so that it accurately reflected, no pun intended, the colors in the space. I also outfitted the space with three cameras, one of which was located inside of the space facing the monitor, which I'd put, displayed a checkerboard pattern on, one of which was lo located on the window ledge to observe the light coming into the window, and one of which was located on the roof next to our weather station to observe the sky. And from those cameras, I can compute information about the visual comfort of the space in several different ways. One of which, my control, is just to use the information from an HDR photograph in the space. The second approach is to model the space and use the picture taken from the window ledge as an environment map to light the space. The third approach is that I can also model the courtyard and use the, the picture of the sky to light the space, and I'll call that a sky map approach. And finally, I can use a numerical model of the sky from the information from the weather station. And specifically, I'm using the Perez All-Weather Sky Model, which is commonly used for this type of simulation. And here are some simulation results from those different methods. 
Hopefully, again, you'll agree that they're all fairly similar. The one that looks the most different is probably the HDR photograph, and that's because while I modeled the window as being perfectly flat, there is, in fact, some lensing characteristics because the window is not perfectly flat. And you can see that as a modeled pattern on the table. I was interested in visual comfort, and so I looked at daylight glare probability, which is represented as DGP and is the likelihood that a person occupying that space with a given view will experience visual discomfort from glare. I can calculate it in this fisheye view by comparing the brightness of a light source such as the sun to the overall illuminance of the space. And I weight the brightness of the sun according to where it occurs in the image. So sources that are located centrally receive a high weight, and those that are in the perimeter that would be blocked partially by the brow or the nose receive a lower weight. Here I'm graphing the results from one day of observation for DGP. And the white line represents the HDR photographic values. The blue lines represent my calculations from radiance with the three methods that I've described. And the orange lines represent my calculations in Accelerate with the three methods. Again, all of the results are fairly similar to each other. They all display the same trends. In the morning, before noon, the sun is in the east and it doesn't come through the west-facing window. So I have DGP values that are low, below my 35% threshold that I would consider to be the minimum for glare. As the sun starts to enter the space, it reflects off of the carpet, which is fairly dark. The space becomes brighter, and the likelihood of glare goes up gradually. Then, around 2.30, the sun starts to reflect off of the table, which is a very bright color. The space becomes much brighter almost immediately, and the likelihood of glare goes up significantly. Then, around 5 o'clock, the sun starts to set behind the buildings on the other side of the courtyard, and the lighting in the room gradually decreases until the DGP values achieve their earlier values. There's one exception to that in this image, and that is if you look at the solid lines which represent the environment mapping simulations, they decrease very suddenly and you get very low simulation readings from them for some reason. And that turns out to be a parallax effect because the sun is much farther away than the buildings on the other side of the courtyard. And so, although it sets gradually, the camera which is located at the bottom of the window sees it setting all at once. And so after it sees the, the sun set, it believes that the entire room is dark, when in fact it's not. Another type of glare that I was interested in was veiling glare. That's when light reflects off of a monitor and makes it difficult to see the image on the screen. So in these two images, the screen has the same brightness, but because sun is entering the room and reflecting off of the table and the monitor in one of the images, it's much more difficult to see the checkerboard pattern in that image. I can represent this through contrast ratio, which is the ratio of the luminance of the high pixel, with light reflecting off of it, to the luminance of the dim pixel. And I can also set a minimum contrast ratio necessary in order to see the image, which is typically around 3 for typical occupied spaces. I get the same patterns when I look at contrast ratio in this space. In the morning, contrast ratios are fairly high because there's not that much direct light entering the space. After around 2.30 in the afternoon, contrast ratios get very low because a lot of light enters the space and can reflect off of the desk and off of the monitor. And in fact, it does become very difficult to see the image on the monitor at that time. And then in the evening after the sun sets, the values go back up and it becomes very easy to see the monitor again. I can also discuss these results as a timeline which is quite interesting for design because it allows me to see when over the course of my, over the course of my experiment there was glare in the space. So these are the results from the HDR photograph. And as you can see, there's the times when, glare, when no glare occurred are shown in white, and the times when there was glare observed through either daylight glare probability or contrast ratio measured in one of two places are shown in gray. And there's also one point when the uh, battery in our camera failed, and so there's no data recorded in that period on April 13th. I can compare that to results from the three methods in Radiance and also in Accelerad. And what we see is that all of these simulation methods come up with fairly consistent and fairly accurate predictions 
of the glare characteristics of the space, which means that prior to building the space, I can come up with accurate predictions of when there will be glare. So what I've shown here is that again using ray tracing with the radiance caching, I've been able to come up with accurate predictions of glare in the space with accuracy between 93 and 99 percent of my predictions, depending on methods used. And I can get a speed up using the, uh, the simulation parameters that I chose for this experiment of up to 44 times, which is quite good. But that gives me results for a few days of my experiment. What if I'm interested in an entire year? Annual simulation usually considers this quantity, spatial daylight autonomy, which is the fraction of the space in which daylighting achieves a level of at least 300 lux for at least 50% of occupied hours. In the image that I'm showing here, the areas colored in orange are those that achieved at least 300 lux for at least half of the time that the space is occupied. And the spatial daylight autonomy is the fraction of the floor area which is colored in orange. And this is typically calculated through matrix-based methods. Essentially, I calculate a set of direct daylight coefficients. Those are the relationships between individual sun positions and sensors in the space. And another set of daylight coefficients that represent the relationship between diffuse patches of the sky and those points in the space. And by multiplying those matrices by vectors that represent the sun position and the sky at a particular point in time, I can calculate the sensor values for that point in time and for any point in time over the year. And this is a method that's implemented in DASIM through the program RTRACE DC. There are other ways that I can do this. For instance, the three phase method breaks those matrices up into smaller parts. A view matrix which represents contributions of the windows, two points in space. A transmission matrix which is a bidirectional scattering distribution function that represents the transmission of light through a window, and a daylighting matrix, which represents the contributions of points in the sky to the windows and considers obstructing factors like the outside environment. And again, when I multiply those together and multiply them by the current sky conditions, I can come up with sensor values. Now, when I do this, because I've now uh, wiped the sun into my sky, the results that I get can be fairly blurry if I were to use an image sensor in this case. What I can do in the five-phase method is to subtract from that the direct component of the three-phase method and add in a more accurate sun calculation to come up with an accurate five-phase method result. And this is what's done in the program rcontrib. And what I want to point out is that both rtracedc and rcontrib are modifications of the original Radiance rtrace program. And that earlier in this presentation, I created an accelerated version of RTRACE. So by combining the changes that went into RTRACE DC and RCONTRIB with my previous work to move that to the GPU, I can create new versions of the programs to do annual simulations on a GPU. And I want to point out a couple of differences between the original RTRACE program and the modified programs. One is that while RTRACE was calculating a color, RCONTRIB and RTRACE DC calculate more complex values. For RCONTRIB, it's contribution coefficients being calculated for each ray, which take up twice as much space as, the, as color storage. And for RTRACE DC, each ray stores a daylight coefficient array, and those take up significantly more space. And in fact, that's a problem that will degrade the performance of the, pro of the program on the GPU because of the amount of memory that's required to run all of those rays in parallel. A second difference is that while RTRACE DC is using irradiance caching as I did before, RCONTRIB uses a process called Russian Roulette. I'm again sending out those rays and doing a diffuse calculation for each one. But in Russian Roulette, I'll arbitrarily choose some of those rays to cull in order to speed up the calculation process. I tested these methods out using the reference office, which is a hypothetical space that's becoming a standard for daylight simulations. Here are some results for spatial daylight autonomy from that office. And I'm showing that all of the results come in around 50%. In fact, they're all within about half a percentage of 50%, with the exception of the DASIM calculation done on the GPU, which is shown in the lighter blue color. 
I wanted to see how this was affected if I tried to calculate more points. So I doubled the size of the office by putting two offices side by side in my model. And again, the results come in fairly similarly. And that stays the same as I increase the number of points that I want to calculate. And that's good. I also ran a model where I put a set of blinds in the window. When I put the blinds in, of course, the lighting becomes much dimmer. And again, it's calculated fairly consistently, except with day simmer on the GPU, where it calculated a spatial daylight autonomy of zero. And the reason that's happening is that irradiance caching assumes that the diffuse lighting over a space is fairly consistent. But when I put blinds in the space, that turns out not to be the case. In fact, simply over the width of the blind, there's a fairly high change in diffuse lighting. And that creates these artifacts that you see in this image, which also negatively affect the simulation results. I was also interested in the speedups that I could get from these different methods. So here I'm showing the speedup on the vertical axis for each method. And with the five-phase method, I get a very good speedup over 25 times. The speedups that I get that aren't very good are from DASIM, especially as the model gets large, because irradiance caching and the number of points that I have to calculate and store in my arrays and the amount of memory that's taken for each of those ends up taking a lot of space, which slows things down. But this is using one GPU. What if I give myself more space by adding a second GPU? In general, I get better speedups, especially with that large model. The case where I don't get big speedups are with my small models. In fact, I got a lower speedup. And that turns out to be because there are only 1,400 points that I'm trying to calculate. But I have over 2,000 cores on my GPU. So in fact, I'm not even utilizing the entire GPU when I have one. And there's no point in adding a second GPU to the process. But what's going to be really important here is what is the actual amount of time that it takes to run these simulations. With that large model, the day sim calculation took over eight hours. Now, I was able to reduce that by half or more by running it in parallel in Accelerad. However, the three-phase method, which gave me the same results, takes less time to run even on the CPU. And when I run that on the GPU, I can get results in a matter of minutes instead of hours. And when I do the five-phase method, if I want accurate results, on the CPU, I could measure that time not in minutes or hours, but in days. But when I run that in parallel, I'm able to get speeds that are faster than what I initially got in DaySim. And that's very positive for this method. And the colors in this chart represent the individual matrices that are being calculated in each part of the calculation. So what I've shown here is that when I run annual simulations using Russian roulette, I can get speedups still in my range of 25 times with less than 1% error. And these are all good speedups, but they're not yet interactive. So for the last part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about what is required to get interactive simulations. And the first thing is that I realized that I needed to abandon this method of distribution ray tracing that I've been using, where the number of rays that I might be interested in grows exponentially with the number of bounces that I send out. And instead, I use path tracing. There's still a direct calculation, but in addition, there's a diffuse calculation that follows one light path out to its conclusion. And I could repeat that diffuse calculation process and create an animation where I continuously add more paths. And the results from that animation look something like this. My first frame, which is frame zero, is just the direct component of the lighting. In frame one, I've introduced one diffuse path. And then in each additional frame, I'll average in the results of one more diffuse calculation. And by the time I get to the 10,000th frame, I have a very accurate simulation that looks very similar to my radiant simulation. If I do the same thing in a space with blinds, I also get an accurate simulation. And in fact, now it looks better than the radiant simulation because it doesn't have the irradiance caching inaccuracies. So I tested this out in the space in the media lab. I took HDR photographs at a number of points in time on a sunny day and also on an overcast day and compared those to simulation results. I'm comparing them by looking at daylight glare probability again. And by the time I get to the 10,000th frame, I have a very accurate daylight glare probability prediction. But the interesting thing to notice 
is that by the tenth frame, my result is already pretty accurate. And because my frames are taking about 200 milliseconds to calculate each, it only takes me about two seconds to get to that fairly accurate prediction. And if I wanted to go even earlier to the very first frame, the result that I'm getting isn't all that inaccurate. It's still probably good enough to conclude whether or not there is glare in that space according to those cutoffs of 35 or 45 percent. So the question that I had was, using this method, can I encourage the idea of flow in design? Flow is a focused mental state in which tasks become automatic and effortless. It's the feeling that we're on a roll or in the zone. And I set up this experiment to see if I could observe flow in designers. In this experiment, I had 40 volunteers try out this simulation where they had to look for areas of glare in the space, and on finding one, they could go in and add shading devices to the space until they found some combination of shading devices that reduced the amount of glare, which is shown in the dial in the right-hand corner of the image. And upon finding something that reduced glare, they could then go in and change the time of day or time of the year to see if it continued to work under different conditions and move around in the space to make sure that it worked at other locations in the space. Here are some results from one of the participants in the study. On one side, I'm showing a model that they worked on that was located in Minneapolis with a program that I call Accelerate RT for real time. And the path shows where in the space they looked, and the thickness of the arrows shows how much time they spent looking at each location in the space. And on the other side, I show them doing the same thing in a different model that was located in Albuquerque using the program Diva for Rhino. In fact, I observed that people tended to look at more locations and more combinations of shading and time when they were using Accelerad, the real-time engine, compared to using Diva for Rhino. And you can see that especially looking at the locations that people looked at in the space. So here I'm showing an aggregate summing up where everyone who took the study looked at. The uh, brightness of each triangle represents how long people spent in that space. And as you can see, using Accelerad, people explored much more of the space than they did using Diva. I also looked at the timeline of their work on this task. So each participant had 20 minutes to use each tool. And in these timelines, five participants on top are using Diva for Rhino. The same five participants on the bottom are using Accelerad. Blue dots represent when they changed the time and date. Orange dots represent when they changed the view. Green dots represent adding or removing shading devices. And for Diva, yellow dots represent when they chose to run a simulation. In Diva, we can see a pattern. Participants change some setting, then run a simulation, wait, change a setting again, and run another simulation. In Accelerad, there is a much more constant pattern of activity. They spend a lot of time changing the view. They find a view that they're interested in, spend a lot of time changing shading devices, and then go back and repeat. And this much more constant pattern of activity makes it look like they might be experiencing some sort of flow. So I was interested in how long did the users spend in each state, each combination of date, time, shading, device, and view location. The orange curve shows for Accelerad, for 50% of the states that they looked at, they spent less than two seconds looking at those states. And only for about 10% of the states they looked at did they spend 10 seconds or more. The blue curve shows the results for Diva. Now there it makes sense that they spent more time looking at more states because it took 20 to 30 seconds just for each simulation to complete. But maybe after those 20 or 30 seconds, their behavior became more like what I observed in Radiance, or sorry, in uh, Accelerad. I could find that out by just sliding the curve over, but I can see that even after the simulation has run, they're not reacting as quickly as they did using Accelerad. This could mean that they've become distracted, or it could mean that they value the results that they get more because they took longer to generate. So they've decided to spend more time looking at the results before trying out something else. But what I really wanted to know was, did people design better buildings 
when they had a faster tool available to them. We don't really have a metric to rate visual comfort over entire spaces or over entire years. So I tried to create one. This is based on simplified daylight glare probability, which is a version of daylight glare probability that can be calculated more quickly because it's based only on the total amount of luminance reaching the eye. And what I did was to take the average over the points and directions that I discretized the space into that I've shown here of the fraction of occupied hours when that simplified DGP value was above 35%. In other words, the average over time and space of when, of when people might experience glare. And here I show some results for the two models that the participants worked in. On the vertical axis, I show that annual DGP value. And on the horizontal axis, I show spatial daylight autonomy. Now the goal would be to come up with a design that had 100% spatial daylight autonomy and 0% daylight glare probability. But that wasn't possible with any of the shading devices or combinations that the participants had access to. So the best they could have done would have been to be somewhere on the lower right-hand edge of this cloud of points that were possible. And what I'm showing with the triangles are the designs that were actually chosen by participants using Accelerad and with the diamonds, the designs that were chosen by participants using DIVA. And the darkness of the symbol represents the number of participants who chose that particular design. And what's interesting to note is that the participants using Accelerad tend to cluster closer to the leading edge, to the parade front of this cloud, than the participants using DIVA. In fact, 32% of participants using Accelerad chose a design that was on the Pareto front, compared to 14% of those using DIVA. And what's even more interesting, 24% of Accelerad participants chose results that were not even close to the Pareto front, compared to 36% of DIVA users, which means that somehow Accelerad allowed participants to come up with more optimal designs. Here are the designs that were chosen most commonly uh, for the two models. The one located in Minneapolis was chosen by seven participants using Accelerad and four using DIVA. And the one on the bottom, was, which is actually located on the Pareto front, was chosen by three participants using Accelerad and one participant using DIVA. So I was also curious, how did the participants feel about the tools that they used? Most of the participants felt more confident in their glare assessments and in the performance of their final designs when they used Accelerad. And that's despite the fact that most participants were more experienced using DIVA. In fact, it's odd that any of the participants said that they felt more familiar with Accelerad because none of them had any prior exposure to the tool. <laughs> I also wanted to know if they had experienced flow. Most of the participants found the test to be more enjoyable and more relaxing and less frustrating when they used Accelerad. And interestingly, most participants also acknowledged learning more using Accelerad. And asked if their overall preference, 90% of the participants preferred using Accelerad overall. So what I've shown here is that using progressive path tracing, we can calculate visual comfort results that are visually comparable to those that are produced by radiance, and that we can generate at interactive speeds, which can benefit the design process. Overall, I've achieved the goals of generating results that are within 20% accuracy of measured values, and that are returned within half a second at interactive rates. So I want to conclude today by talking about what the effect of this on the design profession could be. First of all, we should be able to generate simulations more frequently and starting earlier in the design process. This also means that as educators, we should be worried about teaching simulation more and earlier to designers. It also means that as tool makers, we should be attempting to bring these results into the CAD tools that we use to generate designs. And one more benefit that I want to point out, it also can help us reduce the risk of errors in our simulations. So for instance, 
In this illumination simulation, the spatial daylight autonomy results might look fairly accurate. But in fact, there's an error in this model that only becomes apparent when you do a visual comfort simulation and find out that in fact the wall that contains the window is missing from the simulation because it's on the wrong layer in DIVA. Tools that allow us to run these simulations interactively as we're working instead of after the fact can help us find these errors and correct them more quickly. This also exposes us for the needs for new metrics. So we have metrics that allow us to analyze a space spatially and over the course of a year for illumination. And we have metrics that allow us to analyze a space in terms of visual comfort. But we don't yet have metrics that allow us to combine those two simulations. And that's what we really need. And up to this point, those simulations still take a long time to run. In fact, even using Accelerad, the simulations that I did of that space took about 30 minutes to run each. And when I want to do the entire design space, all 400 designs that were possible for people to choose, that took several days. The good news is that we're back on track with Moore's Law now. Because we can parallelize these simulations, we can continue to take advantage of new transistors that are being added to the chips and the number of cores that we have as a result of those. So I started out by talking about the past in architecture. I want to end by talking about the future. And here's my prediction for the future. And that is that now that we have these tools, we can be using them in immersive environments. So here I've taken the results from Accelerad and sent them to my phone, which is in the set of VR goggles. And in virtual reality, you can now navigate that space and see what the daylight glare probability is like in each view. This could change the way we design spaces, but it also necessitates coming up with new tools that allow us to not only observe the space in this immersive environment, but also to modify it. That concludes the formal part of my talk. I want to finish up by thanking my advisors and readers, uh, Christoph, Malika, and Fredo, and also by acknowledging all of the other people who have made it possible to do this work. And I'd also like to acknowledge the funding agencies that have made it possible for me to do this work and helped me acquire the tools that I've used. On a more personal note, I want to thank my wife, Robin, who's been with me, helping me this entire time. I want to acknowledge the PhD students I've been working with. Uh, Catherine and Carlos, you guys are going to be up here real soon. And I also want to especially acknowledge the rest of the uh, Sustainable Design Lab. It's been great working with you guys for the last four years. Thanks.